Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about a really cool, really intuitive concept in data science called collaborative filtering. Now you might have heard of this before because it's used a lot in recommender systems. So let's go right into the example of today. Let's say that you have started a new video streaming service called Statflix where you host shows that are all about statistics for people to watch and you have a couple of users now and you run into this problem of I need to know what to recommend to my users. So for example, a user that's been using the site for a while has logged in and you have to know what should I recommend to them next in order to make them the happiest. And that's where collaborative filtering comes in. And the driving principle or the key idea behind collaborative filtering is this, which is that past similar preferences can inform future preferences. And to give a little bit of more context to that, it means that, of course, I am not the only user on this Statflix site. There are many other users and they all have the ability to rate the different pieces of content. So they'll watch some show and they'll like it or not like it, and maybe they can rate it between a score of one to five, five being that I really, really like this show. Now, if I have a couple users that have given more or less the same rating to the same piece of content, then I can consider these users similar, which means that they have similar tastes, similar preferences, things like that. So now, if I have one of those users come along and I need to know what to recommend to them next, I might go visit the similar users, so people who are just like them, see what those people have liked in the past, and recommend this person one of those pieces of content. And this is a pretty intuitive, pretty genius idea that I think people use in the real world, even if you have never even thought about stats before, which is just that I might like things that my friends like because my friends are similar to me somewhat, right? So that's the idea, the driving principle behind collaborative filtering. So let's look at a small example to get the idea. And then at the end of this video, I'll talk about some different considerations you might want to think about. So we're going to assume that there's only three users in Statflix so far. Of course, there's going to be many more in a real recommender system, but keeping things simple, three users and we have eight shows. So all that information is captured in this table here. So on the rows, we have user one, user two, and user three. And on the columns, we have the eight different shows that are available on Statflix. Now each user has the ability to rate each show, as I mentioned, between a score of one to five, but that doesn't mean that they're going to rate every single show. Sometimes people just will not rate a show or they haven't watched the show yet and therefore their rating will be blank. So you see that many of these cells are filled in, but many of them are also blank. So the question for today is what should I recommend next for user U1? So if we look at U1, they've rated five of the eight shows, which means that we're going to assume that they haven't yet watched show four, five, or six. And I need to know which show should I recommend to them next. So the next time they sign in, I should show this one to them and hope that they like it. Now, if we were really dumb about this, we didn't take into account the fact that there's similarities between users. We might just take an average of the ratings of these mystery shows for the other users. For example, we see that show four and five have been reviewed by users two and three. So we might just take a simple average. For example, for show four, we would say that user two gave it a rating of two and user three gave it a rating of five. And if we average those two numbers, we get 3.5. And we actually get the same exact number for show five and for show six, we don't have any data, so we just don't think about that one. So if we didn't take into account this intuitive idea of similarities between users, we would get the fact that both of these shows have an average rating of 3.5 across the entire site, across all the users. So you still wouldn't really know which one to recommend to user U1. Now let's be a little bit smarter about this. Let's take into account the similarities between these users. So I've taken this table and I've broken it down into two smaller tables. So these two tables are only two rows each. So it's U1 versus U2 and U1 versus U3. And I wanna look at these tables and get an idea of who is U1 more similar to? Is U1 more similar to user two or is U1 more similar to user three? So if we take the table of just U1 and U2 and the numbers you're looking at here are just the common numbers between these two users. So for example, we have these two fives down here we have the four and three down here, we have the two and two down here, and we have the one and one over here. So if either of these users have reviewed a piece of content, but the other one has not, we don't include that pair. We only include pairs where both of them have reviewed it. Now let's stare at this for a second and realize that these two preferences lists are very, very similar. The only real difference comes from this four and three, and those two numbers are pretty close together to begin with. So what I get an idea of is that user one and user two are ranking these pieces of content very similarly, which is a very powerful concept because it means that, that means that if user two likes something, user one might like that also. Now let's see about user one and user three. So I've done the same thing. It turns out that they have five pairs of content that they share. So I have five columns here and let's take a look at whether these preferences are similar. 
This is a 5 and 1, that's about the opposite as you can get. This is a 1 and 4, also not very similar. 4 and 2, not too similar, 2 and 5, 4 and 1. So these two users don't seem to be agreeing on very much anything. So in my mind I would say that, okay, user 1 and user 3 are not that similar to each other. So if user 3 likes something, it's not very probable that user 1 will actually like that. So how do I take into account these similarities mathematically? So now let's say I want to know what to recommend to u1. I first need to devise some kind of mathematical metric of similarity between these two pairs of users. So the most commonly used metric, but not the only one, is cosine similarity. So cosine similarity between any two users, user i and user j, is given by this formula. But in more simple terms, it is the cosine of the angle between these two vectors. So you can imagine that we have one vector for u1 and another vector for u3. And although these vectors are five dimensional, so I can't draw them for you, you can imagine that there's some angle between these two vectors. So if this was in two dimensions, you can imagine that I have two vectors like this. And the closer they are together, the smaller the angle is going to be between them. And cosine of a small angle is closer to one. So in a nutshell, what the cosine similarity is doing is it's saying that the closer these two vectors are together, or the smaller the angle between those two vectors is, the higher similarity, the more close to one I will give them. And the other end of the story is that the further these vectors are apart to each other, that means the angle between them is going to be bigger and bigger, and therefore the cosine of that angle is going to be smaller, and therefore the similarity score between these two users will be smaller. So that whole story does check out. And that's why people tend to use this cosine similarity so much. Okay, so I won't actually go through the calculation. That's not too important for this video, but suffice to say that if I take the similarity between user one and user two, so that's taking the cosine similarity between this vector and this vector, I'm gonna get 0.99. So this is almost one, almost as high as it could be. Now, on the other hand, if I take the cosine similarity between vector u1 and u3, so this vector and this vector, I get 0.57, which isn't nearly as high. So this does match up to our fuzzy understanding from before. Now what do I do with these numbers? I do a very intuitive thing. I say that if I want to know what would be the estimated rating that user 1 would give to piece of content number 4, before I was just saying that that would be the average, but now I know a little bit better. Now I'm going to take a weighted average, and those weights are given by the similarities between user 1 and the other two users. So the story that's being told here, S12 by the way is just shorthand for similarity between user 1 and user 2. So I'm saying that the estimated rating that user 1 would give to piece of content number 4 would be the similarity between 1 and 2 times the score that user 2 gave to piece of content number 4, which is 2. So basically I'm saying that I'm giving it a rating of 2, but the weight I'm putting on there is only as big as the similarity between user 1 and user 2. I add that to the rating that user 3 gives to that piece of content, which is 5. But of course, I also need to weight that by the similarity between user 1 and user 3, which is given here, S13. And I divide that whole thing by S12 plus S13, just because I need to normalize. If you notice, these two numbers do not add up to 1, so I need to make sure to keep everything in the same bounds, and therefore, that's my denominator. So when I do that, I get that the estimated rating that user 1 would give to this piece of content 4 is actually 3.1, is actually lower than 3.5. Does that intuitively make sense? Yes, because now I know that I'm taking into account user 2's preferences a lot more. And since user 2 really did not like this piece of content, I'm shifting my 3.5 down to 3.1. If I do the same calculation for R15, so I didn't explicitly show the steps, but they're pretty much the same. This is answering the question of what's the estimated rating that user 1 would give to piece of content number 5 Notice that user 2 really liked piece of content number 5, which means that I'm going to upshift my score from 3.5, and that's why you're getting 3.9. So using collaborative filtering, and now I can give kind of an intuition about where these words come from. So the filtering part is basically making automatic predictions about a user, and the collaborative part, as you might have guessed, is we're making these predictions based on collaboration with all the other users in this environment. So using collaborative filtering, I'm able to determine that I should now recommend piece of content number five to my user one because it has a higher score, 3.9 versus 3.1. And that's how collaborative filtering works in a nutshell. And now to end this video, I just wanted to talk about three big uh, barriers to collaborative filtering because this was just kind of a toy example uh, using this Statflix. But I wanna talk about a couple of barriers you run into in the real world and something you do need to think about. So the first big barrier and the one that's talked about most is sparsity. 
So if you notice, we had a couple of blank cells here, but it was nothing that really prevented us from doing our job. But if you think about a real recommendation system, so if you think about tons of pieces of content and tons of users, I think most users don't actually rank anything. They're just there to watch their show and then they're done with it. They don't really take the time to review it. What that means is that your matrix, which is gonna be very big in both directions, is gonna be very sparse, which means that it's gonna have a lot of empty cells. And this is a problem for collaborative filtering because remember the whole heart of collaborative filtering is that I need information about people who are similar to you, but if nobody is rating anything, I can't really get that information too reliably. So collaborative filtering does rely on your matrix not being too sparse. Another issue that goes along with the fact that real life matrices are gonna be much bigger is scalability. So if you notice, we had to do quite a few computations here. We had to do this cosine similarity, this weighted average here. So if you have a lot of users or a lot of shows, this might slow down considerably. So this is something to think about when you actually write the code for collaborative filtering. How do you do this in a way that is efficient and won't slow down your system too much? And the last barrier that I'll talk about is gray sheep or black sheep problems. So what that means is that let's say we have tons of users and let's say that we have one cluster of users around here and one cluster of users around here. Now, gray sheep are those that don't really fit too well into either category. So they're kind of on the border and we don't really know which one to assign them to. So this can be an issue in collaborative filtering or at recommendation in general. And black sheep problems are when we have users that are not close to either cluster at all. They're kind of just on an island by themselves. So we're again, not too sure what to recommend to these users. But again, this is not specific to collaborative filtering, at least this last problem. This is a problem of recommendation systems in general. Um, so I think that's all I had to say. I hope you learned about collaborative filtering and how intuitive and interesting it is in this video. If you have any comments at all, please post them below. I hope you like this video. Please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. And until next time.